Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture nine. So as you can see from today's title, we're talking about testing, which is something we've been doing quite a bit already without too much deliberation, but maybe it's worth putting a little bit more effort to kind of think about this concept a little more deeply, get some better techniques and learn some uh, better ways to use what's existing already in these libraries. We'll be coming back to this concept throughout the quarter, right? So it's kind of us going through our agile approach of trying to close the loop where, you know, we've been writing designs, we've been testing designs, and we've been getting better making designs, so now we need to get better at testing our designs. Uh, and, you know, we'll come back to this in a few weeks when we, you know, want to do more sophisticated, more rigorous testing once again. So, uh, sorry, I need to advance the slides. Uh, as I said, yes, today we're talking about testing. Give a little more, a little bit of treatment, kind of talking about testing in the high-level, big-picture kind of stuff and some overall advice. And then we're going to do some examples, right? We're going to spend a lot of time in these examples. First, we're going to test a module that's purely combinational. Then we're going to show some features available in Scala test. And then we're going to try something that's uh, stateful and decoupled and show how we can test that as well. So let's go ahead and try these out. So, uh, you know, let's go load in our uh, libraries and notebooks. Great. Um, okay, so... Uh, Hopefully many people are already on board with testing, but maybe it's worth just making sure we capture all of the reasons why you should be excited about testing. Um, so why, why, why are we testing, right? Well, uh, it's fun to make things, but uh, other people may not be so excited in you making things unless it works, right? Um, and so yeah, so number one, it needs to work. And so working is something you know, innate to that design, but how do you convince people it works? How do you prove to yourself what you built is correct? How do you prove to other people what you built is correct. And turns out testing isn't just a matter of seeing is it the right thing. It can also be something we use to guide and progress our development, like in test-driven development. So uh, hopefully today, I'm gonna convince you a few things, right? Uh, yes, we're gonna talk about some abstractions and you can use to uh, test within Chisel, but the middle one's the most important, and that is I want you to do testing kind of as an integral part of the whole process, right? Um, I think testing, not just in hardware, but even in software, sometimes is given kind of a too light of a treatment. You know, in courses, we are so excited about just getting the material that we don't talk enough about how we should test these things. And um, even in industry, sometimes this, this comes out where you hear companies say, oh, yes, you know, we have, you know, a ratio of maybe two to one uh, testers to developers, whether it be in software or even in hardware, we have two to one verification engineers per design engineer when you hear these absurd ratios. And when I hear these ratios, I mean, obviously, testing and verification is very important. I'm also thinking this kind of showing that they aren't, you know, um, valuing the testing and the verification early enough and sufficiently enough in the design process, right? So that ratio, should, in my opinion, should be lower, not because verification is not important, but because you have these separate teams uh, and you kind of just toss it off, oh, I'm going to write this hardware module and then the verification team is going to go fix it and clean it up for me. That's kind of putting them on a different tier, right? And it's important to kind of think about this coming in at the same time and the same level and really trying to work on this um, together. So I'm really hoping to kind of get you convinced that testing uh, is a really kind of an integral important thing. So today when I'm saying testing, I'm referring to, as it implies, just checking uh, a module or something like it or design. Um, in the hard design process, there's often a stage referred to as verification where you have a particular design, you really want to make sure it does what you said it does, right? Um, and that's perhaps kind of later on. And a lot of companies even have this notion where, uh, you know, you have a design and you're working on it, and then at some point there's an RTL freeze, meaning you aren't allowed to change the design anymore, and then you go ahead and verify it. And um, I don't like that kind of, you know, do A and then stop B. No, and the point is, no, you're going to do both. You're going to design, verify, design, verify. And if you make the verification process more automated, you can interleave the two more easily. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Okay, cool. Uh, so when it comes down to testing, you need three things. Uh, number one, you need test cases. So how are you going to generate those test cases, right? And so the first test cases is probably going to write manually as a human. <laughs> it's not too bad. And this isn't a disaster, right? For your first Hello World test, you know, writing uh, a test case isn't bad. Also, the human, you can later on use your intuition about the module, or not even intuition, flat out knowledge about the module to know where you really want to make sure you test. Um, but other times you want to use uh, synthetically generated tests, right? And you can do sometimes exhaust testing, just test every possible option. Or... You can use some sort of randomized testing or some sort of directed random, uh, et cetera. And so as I said, today's uh, you know, all about testing. Of course, uh, we will talk about verification of this process later on. And if we're lucky, hopefully maybe a little bit about uh, formal. There's some uh, interesting research going on in multiple places trying to do formal with chisel, and that's pretty cool. 
but we'll see if that can uh, line up by the end of the quarter. I'll be very much at the end of the quarter. Um, number two, uh, you have your test case. How do you know what the right answer to that test case should be, right? So once again, uh, for a very simple first test, maybe the human, you kind of know what you want to be, know what it should be. Um, so that's not bad for getting started, but as you can imagine, it becomes very brittle, right? Uh, you know, how do I know what's happening, right? And what happens if your colleague wants to add a test, but you in your mind are the only one who knows how it's supposed to operate, so they can't really do it, and they have to come bug you, right? So one of the things you're going to learn from this process is that the more you can automate and make things explicit, the more you can make yourself uh, unburdened to your colleagues so they can just do things without you, which is usually a good thing. Uh, you may think about job security, but no, you usually want to <laughs> have people not mad at you and dependent on you. Um, the alternative to making a correct response to a test, of course, is having some sort of model and use that model to generate what the answer should be. Uh, and this is really what's pre preferred, right? This is what you want to do. You want to kind of codify what you expect this thing to be doing and then generate those outputs. Now, these outputs from this model, you can perhaps run a test in advance and get the outputs from the model in advance and then pass those into your testing sy system. Or you might even be able to run the model in parallel with your tests, right? And run the two as a co-simulation. And then the third thing you're going to need is some sort of way to actually perform the test, some sort of way to simulate the design, execute the test, and you perhaps even want to script it to make it you know, able to do more things, right? And so um, there's no magic solution. The kind of things we're proposing today and in this course kind of makes sense for our context, but maybe in different contexts, you may use different things. Uh, and so in particular, what we're going to do, and remember, things you're kind of considering are, number one, just does it solve my needs in terms of getting the right answers? Uh, does it handle the kind of test case I need to do? Uh, does it handle the usage scenarios I have, both in terms of uh, the kind of testing I need to do as well as the platforms it's running on, and also how fast is it? So what we're using in this course is kind of the most default setup for Chisel, but what's nice about it is that it's easy for us to install and distribute. Uh, it's pretty portable and compatible. It's only weakness is speed, but because we aren't doing giant designs for you know millions of cycles, we're going to be fine with that. So in particular, we're going to cover these terms throughout the lecture, but what we're doing for a simulation is using this tool called Treadle, which is a Scala-based uh, uh, simulator for chisel designs, using this library called Chisel Test, which provides some uh, nice features. And actually, we've been using this already, unknowingly. And uh, Scala Test, which is a way to kind of group together tests and organize them together. So uh, as you're going about designing these tests, there's some things you should keep in mind, right? Um, First is thinking about, when you feel about testing from the beginning, is thinking about what do I need to get started, right? How do I close the loop in the beginning? How do I have my most basic module and my most basic test going as soon as I can on day one, right? And the reason why is once you have that, you aren't just writing a module in um, a vacuum and then testing it later on. You can do test-driven development, right? You can uh, think, okay, I want to go add this little bit of feature onto this module. Well, first I'm going to go ahead and add this to uh, a test case, and I'm going to see I fail, but I already have it ready to go. I'm already generating the stimuli and the conditions of my module to cause this condition to arise, and then I can go ahead and fix it or implement it, right? So it's much easier to do that than it is to implement an entire module in a vacuum and then try and test it all at once, right? It's easier to kind of take these little bites at a time. A little bit of feature add, a little bit of testing, or make the test first and then a little feature add to catch up, right? But either way, to kind of taking small steps at a time is going to keep life much easier and much easier uh, so reduce your overall time to solution rather than taking this giant of writing the entire module in a vacuum and then having to try and test this entire thing. Okay, and then when you're thinking about making these tests, right, you should be asking yourself, uh, what sort of coverage do you need? How do I know this is right? So for this course, you know, we want things to be right, but, you know, this isn't quite the, you know, level of correctness maybe required for some of this, you know, mission critical or life, lives depend on it. But, Despite that, within those problems, you should think about uh, where the places this can go wrong and kind of what the things you need to make sure I cover the kind of cases that matter because it may turn out that some input combinations don't make sense, right? Those aren't things we're concerned about. And so maybe we can explicitly disallow those, but the other way you should kind of think about what are the cases that matter. Another thing to think about is when you're considering your design and design tests for it, should you treat it uh, as opaque or clear, right? In other words, do you know what's going on inside designs writing tests or do you not know? So historically, people often may have used the terms uh, either black box or white box for these types of uh, ways of describing testing. And so 
trying to make this course go forward in 2021, and here we are using this more modern terminology of opaque and clear. But in terms of which one should you use, I argue the answer is both, right? Your users see an opaque module, right? They just have an API you have in your documentation. They hope your module lives up to that, right? And so you should definitely make sure that there's some tests and some way design tests that you make sure you live up to those expectations. At the same time, knowing the internals of your module can help you make better tests, right? This is why people get tempted to do these clear box testing, right? Because with that, knowing implementation, you can look at things and recognize, oh wait, this is likely to be an edge case, right? There may be an untestably large number of cases and so you have to kind of prioritize where you test and well, you at least want to make sure you get some of those corner cases, right? And so in order to get those corner cases, you should definitely be thinking about uh, what might arise, right? So for example, how about, you know, when this when goes one way versus the other way? How about um, if things overflow or something like that, right? Those kinds of things. And so you definitely want to think about it. So the answer is you want to think about both of those. Okay, and so there's a, there's a few more of these slides, but we're, we're getting through it and we're getting the examples in just a moment. In terms of kind of parting advice, my number one goal is to get humans out of the loop for testing, right? When people develop hardware, it's very common to say, oh, you do something, do something similar to software. It's kind of like, okay, I'm write this code, write this hardware, and then just kind of run it, maybe give it an input, and then see what the output is. Oh, wait, yes, that's the output. I expected this person to write the test five minutes ago, so great, it's done, it works. Um, that's basically useless as a test, right? Because number one, it's not actually checking itself, right? It's a simulation. The checking was done by you, the human, knowing what the right answer should be, and then looking at the output and manually verifying the output matched that, right? So that is not really a test, right? That's something you should avoid. Um, and so if that point is you kind of want to make a test, which is not only just uh, an input stimuli, but also a checking to make sure it matches something, right? Um, and that's kind of the thing I want you to think about, right? Is you want to have a test where someone can just set test or Better yet, some server may be running automatically and run test, and it does the test. It doesn't need you to be there to say, oh, nope, that's the right input, wrong output, or, you know, et cetera. You want to get yourself out of the loop. Um, and so things like print statements and waveforms are really helpful for debugging, not for testing. If someone asks you how do you know this module is right, and to go open up a waveform after simulating it to look at the values, you've not made a test. You've made a simulation, but you've not made a test. And so go ahead and take the extra step to figure out what it takes to analyze the output and check it against something, right? So number one goal, get humans out of the loop. Um, number two, uh, we'll cover the RAN testing later, or later today, I mean. Um, at first, it seems really great. I'm just going to try all these combinations. We'll find all the bugs, right? They can definitely find some bugs. But random has limits, right? In particular, uh, you know, if just randomly exploring this design space is you know, far too for you, large for you to do exhaustively, you may not necessarily reach all the interesting corner cases. Uh, and so to help find those corner cases, perhaps you want to use that, you know, clear knowledge was inside the module to make sure you cover those cases. You may have directed random, even just full on manual test cases to make sure you cover those corner cases. Another issue of random is if you keep running a random simulation, you may get different simulation results. And so you may have a random test case run, maybe it finds a bug. And you're like, oh my gosh, I need to go and fix that. I'm going to debug it. You hand off to engineers to go try and fix it. And they run a simulation again, and they can't reproduce the bug because their random execution didn't have the same combination of inputs that caused that bug. Yeah, that's not good. So what do you want to do? Well, you can seed your random number generator. And by seeding your random number generator, your simulation uh, is now deterministic. That's good. The downside, of course, is that now you run a random test multiple times you get the exact same result. So uh, if you do use seeding, you perhaps may want to use multiple seeds or just increase your iteration count in order to make sure you still get the coverage you want. Um, that's something to be aware of, right? So uh, seeding is something to consider if you're worried about reproducibility, uh, et cetera. And then third, you may see us kind of occasionally tossing assertions or require statements into our code so far. You should keep doing that. Um, but assertions don't remove the need to test, right? Uh, what assertions are is a way for us to check that certain things are true. Uh, and these are really best for things where if this is not true, it's going to cause things not only to break, but to break in ways that are subtle or hard to detect or won't break for a while. If the thing that's wrong is going to cause it to fail immediately and be really clear it's wrong where it came from, you may not need an assertion, right? And so this assertion is kind of ways for us to use this, right? And so 
within our ecosystem, right, there's assertions that are executing in Scala that are run at a libration time, as well as we actually put assertions in a chisel that run uh, in simulation only, but will not be synthesized in hardware. But as I said, sure, you can use assertions, but they don't uh, replace the need for testing. Another great time to consider assertions is after you've written your tests and you've uncovered a very subtle bug and you've gone through all this effort to tra track it down. Oh my gosh, was that a hard bug? It was so subtle to find. Yeah, if that bug was a kind of consequence of something going wrong here and in there and kind of cascading through your design, you should probably go ahead and figure out going back to that process you had to do to figure out maybe put an assertion early on to try and catch it early on, right? Where often when you're debugging, what are you doing? Well, you're looking at the output that's mismatching and you kind of trace, well, if that's wrong, what was that produced from, right? Okay, well, how's that compared to what I expected to be? Or how's that compared to what you're going back up? Put the assertion early on. And sometimes you'll find in a large complicated project that, you know, uh, sometimes a bug kind of reemerges, right? And it's not a nice thing to happen, but hopefully assertions can help you detect that right away, right? Um, and this is what happen, happens, where maybe there's a uh, underlying cause, which you, know, you don't fully understand in your design, or you keep making the same mistake over and over again. But if you have an assertion later on in your design, maybe you can catch that early on, or remind yourself, oh, wait, you forgot to make this one thing happen, and use that. So assertions are definitely very helpful, but you can use them with testing. Great. Okay. Um, so kind of wrapping up our conversation about testing as an overview is a big concept. I, I really want you to think about testing as kind of useful in multiple phases, not just, you know, at the end, making sure you built the right thing. Um, but it's helpful for initial development, right? We want to do test-driven development, you know, often called TDD. Uh, you can put it on a server and running in the background, continuous integration. It can be continuously looking at people pushing code to your uh, version control and seeing uh, if they're changing anything. It's also really helpful for working with other people, right? Where if you put uh, your code, on, your design online and someone else works with it, um, the tests not only help them convince themselves that what you produce is, you know, reasonable, but they also may want to change it. And when they change it, they weren't you. They don't know all the things you thought about when you designed it. So for you, when you consider a design change, you're like, oh, wait, um, I know how this thing is designed and connected, so I would never think to change this thing in this way. They aren't you. They may not know that. <laughs> and thus, if you, if you have highly, if you have good tests, they can make a change and then make sure they didn't break it. Or also, even better yet, if they make a change and then try and give it back to you, how do you convince yourself they didn't break it? There may be scenarios where the amount of code they're giving you is so much that you, although you do want to do a code review, it may not be feasible for you to really think about all the ramifications. Having a strong test suite and having it pass your, pass your strong test suite gives you a much higher vote of confidence in looking at this thing, right? Because, for example, consider the alternative. If your alternative is you don't have a test suite, but instead you have a couple simulations that trigger some input stimuli and use a human look at the waveform outputs and manually verify it, um, not only can they not do that, but then you receive the code from them to go ahead and go through the whole process again. And what if there's like one thing wrong and you got to redo it and they got to send it back to you again? No, automate that. Get humans out of the loop. <laughs> um, and another thing you might do is uh, when you're designing, you may explore multiple parameter options, right, for your generators and design space exploration. You can actually also do testing at that time as well, right? Not because you want to over constrain the physical options you're choosing, but it's just another chance to make sure that your generators are working correctly at these other design points, which maybe you may not have considered when you were doing your initial um, uh, design and development. And so that's the whole point I'm trying to get you excited about, thinking about testing kind of throughout much of this process. And um, especially think about it early. And you can, thinking about it early can help you do a better job at it, right? So in particular, when you carve up your design into, you know, sub-modules and modules and how do you choose your abstractions internally, don't just think about, um, you know, what makes sense to you conceptually for design. Also think about what might be testable parts, right? You may have some parts which when you're trying to think about that module and how am I test that in isolation, it may be a really awkward unit. So maybe you can figure out that internally, actually, you know, maybe these internal components, if I draw the boxes the right ways, these boxes are easier to test. Okay, Greg, I can test those units individually. And maybe this subsystem as a whole is easy for me to test, right? You kind of can start figuring out where the boundaries are easy for me to test things, right? And remember, of course, that we know with modern CAD tools, uh, you know, where we draw model, module boundaries is something we as humans look at, but it's not going to really affect uh, the physical efficiency of design too much, assuming you do things like, you know, flat design uh, when it does the you know, physical implementation. So it's important to kind of make sure these module boundaries make sense for what we want in terms of having good code reuse or perhaps in this case, good testability. 
Another way you can improve testability for your design when you're kind of thinking about it is combination modules are often much easier to deal with than these stateless things that have no memory. And so if you can perhaps compose your design into more stateless things, and then on the other hand, uh, you know, have these kind of stateful things kind of placed in deliberate locations that are easy to kind of reason about, that may also make your life easier. Whew. Okay. Um, before I go into the concrete details of testing, I'm going to pause for any brief questions on the overview of testing as a whole, like a general concept. So the question was, uh, would you recommend testing at homework or what level of depth would you recommend for testing on the homework? Uh, I would definitely recommend testing for the homework. So uh, I'm sure some of you may be finishing up homework two right now. And perhaps you're on the uh, problem with the finite state machine and realizing, oh my gosh, just test case is kind of hard to deal with and this is kind of hard to debug. Um, it's better not having that, right? That's kind of a bare bones thing. Part of the challenges that Simon was produced last week when we hadn't taught you as much, after today we'll be able to make more sophisticated, uh, more productive test benches. Uh, yes, I really do recommend uh, testing. Now in terms of managing um, overall number of hours for the course, making that reasonable, depending on the assignment and the problem, we will often give you some amount of testing infrastructure. Uh, and depending on what we're going for in a particular assignment, maybe we'll give you uh, more or less of it or ask you so you fill in some parts that will give you a big overall structure and you kind of fill in some portions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's kind of the point is, yes, you definitely will be thinking about testing. You should definitely be doing testing. Uh, you aren't necessarily need to write all these tests from scratch every time, every week. Great. Okay, so what's testing like in Chisel? Um, one thing that happens when we pitch, uh, people talk about these things about chisel and using generators and say, oh wait, those generators sound like a nightmare for verification and testing, right? Uh, aren't they harder to test? For example, just testing the inputs and how it behaves, but you'll need to test the inputs in the hardware design when actually it's running, as well as the parameters to make sure it's you know, generating the right thing for the entire parameter space. That seems like a way bigger design space to verify. Um, yes, that's true, but there's some nice caveats to respond to that. Number one, we can parameterize the test generation. So depending on the nature of the parameters for our module, we can have parallel constructs, you know, mimicking the um, functionality of the design generator in our test generation. So if we have certain knobs in our generator, we can put those knobs in our testing and we're able to kind of match that up. So number one, we are not forced to generate a zillion static tests. No, we can generate these adaptive dynamic tests to match our flexibility of our generator. Number two, remember when we're making a generator, the whole point is we want to have reuse, right? So we want to have this generator and want to have it used over multiple instances. So because it's going to be used in multiple instances and kind of replaced in those cases, it's also more time for us to amortize the cost of developing that testing infrastructure, right? Um, if you're only making one instance and then one in testing thing, sure, but then we're trying to make a generator which makes multiple instances, so thus it's worthwhile or reasonable to justify the development testing wise of multiple instances. And guess what? The number of instances doesn't need to be very high before building a parameterized test generator is actually less effort. Um, so that's kind of a nice thing. In terms of what we're using, uh, there's this library called chisel test, which we're using, which is uh, kind of hot off the presses, so to speak. Um, there has been various generations of chisel testing libraries and chisel test is the newest one. It's still kind of in the development phase. Uh, but we've already been using this course, um, and that's part of why I like it. It has uh, a much shorter syntax in some places, so it's kind of better for these concise notebooks we're using. And what it does is actually it runs a Scala program where you can run that as your test bench and kind of define whatever you want with Scala, the full power of Scala is at your disposal for generating your test cases. And then it talks to a simulation you designed to do things like peek and poke, as we've seen so far. Um, in terms of what's actually in the simulation, we're using this tool called Trello, which I used a moment ago, which is a Fertile, that's you know, the, the Chisel uh, IR. It runs directly in Scala. It's nice, it just runs right away. No crazy install options. As a step up, which is supported by the tools, is something called Verilator. It's an open source Verilog simulator. So in order to use that, you actually need to take your Chisel design, turn it into Verilog, pattern that Verilog to Verilator, which Verilator is then gonna do its own crunching on 
turn that into a plus, and then compile that into a very fast, customized, effectively inlined uh, simulator for your design. Um, and then that very later simulation, which is, you know, a compiled with plus program, can talk back to Scala through some interprocess pipes. And so although the very later simulation is very, very fast, like, you know, orders might be faster than Treadle, um, when using chiseled tests, it's not going to be super big difference because, number one, the chiseled test harness is running at Scala speeds, and because interprocess communication is going to slow it down. Um, and there are other uh, simulators out there, but they may be able to talk to this protocol. Now, chiseled test isn't the only uh, you know, game out there. There are older chisel libraries out there which have kind of a similar structure, and some organizations don't even use it at all. Right? Some organizations uh, will write their test benches directly in Verilog, uh, or perhaps testing for all to get perhaps more expressibility. Or and there's a technique some groups use is they actually write their testers in chisel, not chisel test, but actual chisel as in modules. And these are modules they will pass through the tools. Uh, and they're not going to manufacture these in real design, but they manufacture, they push those into the same simulation environment, and this thing can run entirely in that fast world, whether it be Verilator or something else. And so there's a lot of options out there. For this course, we're kind of you know taking what's easier to install and easy to get going. Technically, it's not going to scale to giant designs, but that's fine for us in this course. We're kind of turning around quickly. Okay, so uh, let's talk about testing a combinational component. So like I said, they're stateless, which is nice because I can just uh, throw uh, an input or test case at it, and it's not going to um, be dependent on prior test cases or prior cycles, right? So that's great. Easy things to test. And so things we're considering for testing a combinational component, consider a range of inputs, Consider the range of generated parameters, right? It may also affect your module. And then uh, you also want to make sure change the slide real quickly. Uh, it should be the parameters impact on the input space, right? In terms of, you know, uh, if you change certain parameters, it may change the size of inputs that are possible, right? Because if you change a bit width, now all of a sudden, you know, you have perhaps more or fewer inputs to consider, right? If you have a very small input space, you can exhaustively test it. You can just test every combination, right? Which may be nice, it may be kind of comforting, um, but it's obviously not going to handle every case. Uh, and one thing you can often do is if you have a parameterized design, maybe we'll turn the parameters down small enough where exhaustive testing is feasible, and then you can also test non-exhaustively for larger instances of your design. It was maybe kind of a nice hybrid combination, which is good. Um, so let's go ahead and do this. And so uh, what are we going to be testing? We're going to be testing a adder that does sine and magnitude style numbers, right? So we talked about this earlier in the course, you know, sine and magnitude where there's a number and we use a bool represent if it's positive or negative, right? Okay, so uh, we defined the bundle to kind of encapsulate it together nicely. And we just made an adder, right? So okay, it takes in two inputs of the sine and mag, uh, has an output to sine and mag, and then how do we do the math? Well, if, uh, you know, the signs are the same, we can just add their magnitudes and the output sign is the same, right? And if you know, um, if the signs are different, then we need to subtract them. And so which one subtracts from which one? We're gonna do that by looking at which one's bigger. And then um, set the sign appropriately. So okay, we can go ahead and define this module. Great. And let's go on from here. So, uh, you know, doing things that we covered so far, we would go ahead and just write a test like this, right? So this nice, concise syntax is some of the features of chisel test. Uh, you know, we have our instance of it, and you know, we have our designer test. And oh, sorry, there's a question. Let me go back. Yes, go ahead. Question. So the rule is uh, you need to specify input or output direction for every signal eventually, right? Uh, otherwise, the tools can't infer it. Can't, if you don't label which way it's going, the chisel cannot tell you. So it doesn't need to be labeled as input or output. Now, you're right. I could label this as, you know, input or output in here. Um, I chose not to because I did it later on. I did the next level up. 
And so when you do it this way, it applies its direction to the entirety of the bundle, right? And so the reason why I chose to do this way is because here we're kind of thinking of sign and mag as like a number representation, or almost like a data type in a way. And then later on, we can decide if it's input or output. Now for something like the couples where you know some things need to kind of have, you know, opposite directions, you know, like ready and valid need to be opposite directions, then perhaps maybe it's worthwhile declaring the inputs and outputs directly inside the bundle to kind of set the, t the directions. And remember also later on, we can use flipped to change the directions. But um, in this case where we, uh, you know, did this way, I kind of like to have uh, this not bottled directions. So it's kind of very clear and easy to read. And then applying directions here makes sense. Right now, if, you know, if I forgot to, for example, uh, apply the direction here, I'm pretty sure to get some sort of error. It's not going to give us an error now, but it'll give us one later on, so let's, let's, let's avoid that headache. Um, but yes, uh, so every, every I.O. Uh, thing needs to have a direction given to it eventually. It's just a question of where. And so we chose to do it here as opposed to in there, but both are possible. It would. So the reason why in this case, for example, so let's say, for example, so the question was, okay, well, why don't I, you know, uh, you know, do this, right? Uh, I could, right? So if I did that, then I wouldn't need to put the output here. Great. But now for these, I need to do flipped, right? Because I want them to be inputs. So yeah, so, so it needs to be there somewhere, right? Uh, and so uh, I think it's kind of easier to have it this way. Uh, at least, or sorry, easier slash more clear. Uh, but I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about directions always being in bundles or always being at the declaration point. No problem. Okay, so we write a test like we, you know, been doing poking before, right? So we poke in uh, no signs. We're just saying one plus two and, you know, Yes, it's three. Okay, so that worked. Uh, but as you're you know, seeing, this is a, a lot of stuff, right? Oh my gosh. And how am I going to generate a lot of tests this way? So we're going to go ahead and try and start getting a little bit more structure to this, right? So um, one thing we can do is to make a model, right? So remember we said we're testing elements, right? First, we want to have a test stimuli. Then we also know what's correct. And so having this model is going to make it easier for us to kind of know what's correct. And so what's nice about having Scala available to us, which advantage Chisel has over some languages like Verilog is we have the power of full programming language for generating these tests, right? As well as generating our models. We can kind of very concisely express what we want to do. So in this case, what do we want to do? We want to model the adding behavior. So you're taking in two integers. In this case, we're taking advantage of the default, you know, sign interpretation inside of Scala. Uh, I put these in here because uh, ends the bit width, right? I put these in here because Scala is in by default for two bits. We want to make sure we don't break that. Um, Okay, uh, and so actually, I guess technically because of the sign, we probably should do it that way. Um, and what do we need to do? We also need knowledge to capture the summing behavior. We also need to handle the behavior of it truncating and overflowing, right? Uh, and so how do we do that? Well, we can do a little Boolean arithmetic, or, or sorry, a little binary arithmetic, excuse me, and compute a mask, right? So uh, this is going to be all ones. In particular, this is going to be n. Uh, ones, right? So for example, if n is 1, uh, 1 shipped over 1 to the left is going to be 2 minus 1 is 1. Or if you know n is 8, right? Then we get um, uh, 256, right? Uh, minus 1, 255, or, uh, you know, 8 ones, so to speak. Uh, that's a nice way to get that. And then we can go ahead and use that. So for an, the positive case, it's easy. We just mask it directly. Now, for the negative case, this is a little bit extra fancy here where, okay, what do I do? Well, first I have to make it positive, mask it, and then make it negative again. That's just some sleight of hand. Um, you'll see this happens a lot in lectures about Chisel. We're kind of talking about Essent or other things like that. It turns out in practice that signed numbers are usually pretty rare <laughs> in the deep of hardware designs. And so if the sign, you know, if the here isn't a little confusing, don't worry. It's usually not super common. But, okay, so we defined uh, the behavior we wanted. And so, okay, you know, let's say if we add two numbers together and we have a four-bit size for it, we get eight. That's what it says it should be. Now, remember, 
we could have this overlapping behavior. So for example, if I only had three bits of width to hold this, uh, you can definitely hold four and three bits, yes, but you can't hold eight, right? That's gonna be the overflow condition. And so actually the correct behavior would be for us to recognize that that's not gonna be representable. And also it's gonna be overflowed to zero, I should say. Okay, so we'll go ahead and leave that alone for a second. So now we defined uh, the Scala function kind of act as a model for the thing we're trying to do. Uh, let's keep going. So uh, given that model, we want to automate the interaction with it. So we're creating this function, which uh, after we're done with it, gives us some very nice simple syntax, right? Now we can just say, hey, uh, test you know, two plus three on a four bit number with this design instance. Boom, and does the rest for us. So what is all that rest is doing for us? Well, we need to poke in the inputs, the stimuli, right? So how are we gonna do that? Well, okay, so for the sign, if it's negative, we, of course we need to encode that. So that's what we're doing is check here and turning that to a bool. Okay, those are the signs. So if it's positive, of course, these are gonna be false. Then for the value, because we've already encoded the signs appropriately, we'll make sure these are positive numbers. So we use, you know, in this case, absolute value to handle that. So now we have positive numbers going in for the, for the magnitudes. Um, now, uh, this is not super critical. This is me making a printf, which is handy for us to see what's going on. In particular, I want to see, okay, what am I adding? And then what's the result? Um, and so in order to kind of capture that, I did a little bit of work to figure out um, if the uh, output's going to be negative or not. Um, this is the output from natural design. So one thing you may notice, for example, is we keep talking about peak and poke, but for the most part, we're only doing poke and expect. Uh, you actually can do peak. It returns a chisel literal to you. In order to make do anything with that literal, you need to cast it, right? So in this case, we're casting it to a Boolean. There's also a two value, uh, which is another way for you to kind of do things with it. So in this case, we're seeing, you know, is the uh, output sign bit, you know, true? If it is, we're going to use a negative sign down here. Uh, if not, we're not going to use a negative sign. Then we have a nice string interpolation. Uh, in terms of uh, what's going on, oops, I just gave away my comment. Let's pretend you didn't see that if statement. Um, so what, what, what do we expect for the sign? Well, we're going to, you know, see is the output of our, you know, thing negative. If so, it should be sign, otherwise it's, it's positive, right? Or it's, uh, it'd be false for the sign bit. And in the magnitude, of course, we're going to use the result of our model add. So if we go ahead and run this, uh, it ran, right? And because there was no exceptions triggered, no expects failed, we got, you know, there's nothing happened. So let's see what it did, right? So our print statement helped us out, right? You know, it printed out, hey, we passed in two plus three and the result for module is five. So that's kind of helpful for us to kind of debug this. Like I said, these print statements aren't us checking the thing, they're for us debugging and knowing what's, knowing what's happening, right? Um, and uh, what about, you know, minus one plus one? Okay, and now what happens uh, if I had another test case? Uh, that is like this. Is this going to fail? Oops, maybe I'll flip, flip it around. There we go. So what just happened? Uh, everything, everything seemed right, right? Um, well, this is actually nothing wrong with the uh, module. This is something wrong with our test and arguably it's something wrong with sign and magnitude. So remember sign and magnitude encodings, uh, part of why they're not great <laughs> is they have two zeros, right? You can have a zero magnitude with the positive sign and a zero magnitude with the negative sign. And our strict tester here is only checking for one. So what this uh, thing here, which I shouldn't have uh, left in there, is saying only check the sign if it's not zero. Because if it is zero, it turns out either sign is permissible. You can either be positive or negative. That's actually allowable by sign and magnitude. So thus, we're going to optionally elect to actually not perform the expect operation, right? We're going to not do it if it shouldn't be checked because both options are okay in that case, right? So now with that, it's going to work, right? Because yeah, this produces zero and you can see it actually produced a negative zero, which is a weird thing to talk about, but that's, that's sign and magnitude for you. Um, this is why, of course, yet another reason why these comments great.
Okay, maybe I'll pause here if there's any questions so far. And so if you're following along, you're probably saying, wait a second, you know, uh, I just wanted to add two numbers together. And already I'm starting to write, you know, a non-trivial amount of code, right? I had to write, oops, if I go back a slide, I had to write this model. I had to write this uh, test. But this is helping, right? This is us reasoning about design. For example, this is helping us identify this condition where, guess what? In sign and magnitude, you have a positive and negative zero. <laughs> That's an important thing to be aware of, right? And so even though it seems like a lot of extra stuff we're writing, as we get more clever about how we kind of factor things together, it's not that much more stuff, and it's really going to help us in the long run. Even in the span of a one-week homework assignment, uh, good tests written while you're developing, it will help you get through to the end quicker. Okay. So then, let's remind ourselves what we built so far. We have this ability to say test. We can give it inputs. It's going to use a model internally. Uh, that function we define to actually determine what the correct output should be. So all we need to give it is the inputs, the bit width for the generator, from, and then the, um, the actual instance, right? Uh, so now if we want to take advantage of that, what can we do? Well, we could, for example, test exhaustively. So uh, if we say uh, for a given bit width, we figure out what's the biggest number we can hold, right? We can do that. And then we can uh, build a mod, instantiate a module, and then use these for loops to go from all possible values, right? In this case, we have these negative and positive numbers. Okay, so we're going through these ranges, and then we're testing them, and we're gonna turn off the verbosity, right? So I put a bool, uh, to con sorry, a boolean to control uh, the, um, this, this print statement about whether or not what's going on. The reason why, as you can see, because we're going exhaustive, there's gonna be a lot of these, right? So for this tiny little test, sure, it, it passed, you know, uh, if we make a bigger one, it's passing. So we have, so far, tests in a module that are consistent with each other. That's perhaps a better word to use than correct, because that implies we know for sure our tests are correct, which we hope they are. But right now, we might use the word consistent, right? Our tests and our design are consistent with each other, and hopefully our, our tests are, are correct. Um, let's go ahead and turn on that verbosity and see what happens, right? And we can see that, you know, it's trying all these combinations, right? Um, and remember, because of the way we have this limited bit width, it is doing the overflow checking for us, right? So for example, okay, minus three plus minus three, that's gonna be minus six, but because of the way it's truncating it, right, it actually turns out to be minus two, right? Uh, et cetera, right? So you can kind of see how this plays out. Um, cool, so already kind of starting composing things and building up things up together. And now what have we done? Well, now we've exhaustively tested all inputs for a given uh, bit width, right? And make this, you know, not too big. It's probably start taking a non trivial amount of time to run, right? Done elaborating. It's churning away. Remember, what am I testing? Uh, two to the eight values for A, two to the eight values for B. So that's, uh, you know, two to the 16 things, right? Whew. Yeah, it definitely did a lot of work there, right? Uh, why? Because it was running a bunch of tests, right? So you can see very quickly that, you know, exhaustive testing is not always feasible. And remember, like if you have in this case, these nested loops, uh, it, they multiply together in terms of the design space. So it really blows up fast. Um, cool. Uh, let's keep going. So uh, we did the exhaustive test. And so now let's talk about doing a random test. Uh, okay, so how are we going to do a random test? Well, we're going to need that bit width to know how big it is. We're going to need instance to play with, sure. And they're going to build a function to generate an input. So what's it going to do? Well, it knows from the bit width uh, how big a number can be. Uh, and then we're going to use, uh, you know, the Scala built-in random libraries. Once again, it's nice to have a programming language at our disposal. Um, Scala's random utils, uh, are exclusive bounds. That's why there's no minus one here or anything. Uh, so we find a random magnitude within the range, find a random sign, which is a Boolean, which we can just do with, uh, as a bool, we can do with Boolean. And then we produce a number, of course, we can say, okay, if it's negative, we want to make it negative. If it's not, we don't. And what do we do? Well, we run the function we built before and we can use uh, the inputs we produced, right? And then we can go ahead and pull these all together. 
So that's pretty cool. You can see very quickly how we're kind of building up abstractions and then building more sophisticated abstractions on top of those, right? We're kind of building our way up this food chain for testing here, so to speak. Um, so now if we want to do a random number of tests, I say, hey, I want to do, you know, uh, some number of trials. Well, instantiate the module inside a test environment, right? And then let's just run through it, right? So for a number of trials, I'm going to tell it to test randomly. So, uh, okay, let's go do it for five trials. And we see, oh yeah, here's, you know, some random numbers in that range. And it said before, right, with a random test, and I didn't seed it, if I go ahead and run it again, it's going to be different. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things where I for random tests, you're probably going to want to see it. But for now, we're just trying to see more things. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I mean, hey, it's not hard for us also to say, you know what? Hey, give me a whole bunch, right? It's easy, right? It's kind of thing. So uh, you can imagine how much work it is to maybe manually, if you go all the way back, right? Remember how much work it was oops, to write this test case, right? Six freaking lines for one test case, right? And yes, you could copy, paste, and replace some things, but oof. That, that, that productivity is actually not good, right? You're probably going to get bored real fast making these test cases. You're probably going to write like four or five of them. you like, oh my gosh, that covers it, right? No. Make the automation and make it easy to make more, right? So what do we do? Well, we made a model. Then we figured out a way to compose the model with interacting with our design and our test. We made a function do that for us. Uh, so we automate that interaction. And then now we have to automate interaction. It's just a matter of giving it inputs. And the model's going to tell us what the right output should be, and it's going to check that against that automatically. And so in order to generate the stimuli, well, we did it either exhaustively or randomly. That's kind of a quick recap of what we've done. And yeah, I'm going to pause here if there's any questions so far. So the, the question was kind of about what's the you know motivation for exhaustive or how do you kind of weigh between manually created corner cases versus uh, exhaustive? Um, I think it's one of these things where uh, you can take those perspectives of are you treating design or test as opaque or clear, right? If it's opaque to you, you're kind of tempted to go exhaustive because you don't know what's going on inside there. You want to make sure it kind of cover all your bases. Uh, but if you know what's going on inside there, and in this case where we're doing addition, you know it's perhaps not a super crazy assumption to assume that, you know, when you write a plus operator, this tool and the other tools downstream are going to do the right thing. So assuming some plus operations work, uh, you know, you may be able to make some sort of semi, you know, uh, inductive uh, <laughs> reasoning about, well, perhaps these other additions will also work out, assuming there's no overflow or anything like that. That's not super unreasonable to think about. And that's the sort of thing you need to consider when you run a scenario where exhaustive is definitely off the table. Um, the times where exhaustive gets tempting is where it's not so much exhaustive on some numerical input you're doing math on, but perhaps on maybe like an enumerated type. Like maybe you're trying to try all message types or you're trying to try like all settings on a mux or something to control something. In which cases, you know, or in, in which case the combinatorics there may not blow up so bad, uh, but also it may be more important to try and test out, right? Maybe you have some module and you have like all these Boolean inputs that can control what certain things happen and yeah, maybe you are worried that somebody's going to have a combination of input commands that you don't expect that's going to break stuff, right? In so which case, then exhaust is more helpful. But I think your intuition about, you know, if I have this giant, you know, numeric range and, uh, you know, is it not unreasonable to assume that some things may kind of hold true over those large ranges? No, that's not super unreasonable, right? You have a large range of arithmetic, you can't do this, right? I mean, if I had, for example, two fifty numbers being added, I couldn't do two to 64 tests, right? Because that would be the space for the two. Infeasible, right? So you have to do random, you have to do the corner cases. So um, random corner cases is definitely uh, the common case. Exhaust is kind of, you know, ace in the hole we kind of can play when the space is small and we don't want to think about it. Okay. Um, so uh, let's keep going.
Uh, so I, as promised, we're talking about Scala tests. Like I said, this is a, a library that's you know, beyond Chisel. Um, and so it's actually really nice. It's uh, a well-supported, well-adopted testing uh, framework within Scala. And uh, SPT, the tool we use for kind of our you know, building and stuff, is totally aware of Scala tests. So a lot of stuff works out really well. So you may have noticed, for example, inside of our homework repos, we have our file organization such as you know, source slash main or source slash test, right? And yeah, uh, SPT looks for things to run under source slash main, looks for things to test under source slash test, and that handles it automatically. It knows what Scala test is, knows what Scala test looks like. If you just say, you know, test inside SPT, it's going to try and run every Scala test it can find. That's fine. Uh, there may be times where you only want to run a certain test, like you're debugging a certain thing. You can use the command test only, and you can give it the package name and the class name, even the test name, to kind of get further and further precision in what you want to run. And you can definitely have multiple uh, Scala test classes in the same project, no problem. Uh, that's not going to cause any problems. When you run tests, let's run one to the next one to the next one. And it turns out, um, as I said before, Chisel test is kind of using under the hood, and I was kind of tell you a name for it. Scala test, you've also been using under the hood, but it's kind of telling you a name for it. Cool. So uh, let's say we want to go ahead and wrap this up inside of Scala test. I'm sorry, and to be clear, we've been using Chisel test every time we've been testing these modules. We've only been using uh, Scala test in the homeworks where we actually run bigger stuff. So what's the extra syntax we need? We need to find uh, a proper tester. So we do this through object-oriented inheritance. So this is something from uh, Scala test, and then it's something from Chisel test that knows how to interoperate with that. Um, but then there's some interesting syntax here. So we basically are giving it a name for what we're testing. Uh, and then we actually name each of the test cases. And, you know, this does not look like programming, right? It's, you know, spaces in English, right? Um, this is Scala, right? I told you how they can do these like, function calls and arguments uh, without punctuation. And it kind of has a very literate style of writing test cases. So you can say, hey, you know, it should, and it is implicitly referring to this thing you're testing. And you're kind of giving names to it, right? Uh, now here I'm being for saying what the test case is actually doing. You might actually have a more English written out thing you want to do. As you can see here, you can also do string interpolation and kind of generate what goes inside these strings. But you know, when you have this thing uh, in braces, it's actually to test the runs, and then inside there, using that chisel test thing to run. So here, I just put together two, you know, specific one-off cases, right? And uh, I need to instantiate this test class. And you see here, I even made the parameterized test class. Why not? Um, and then you tell execute, right? And you don't need to call this when you do SPT tests, but this is us, you know, trying to run it right here in the notebook to show you. Yes, I do. Um, and uh, you may have noticed in the very first slide, I also imported Scala tests as additional import compared to prior lectures. But uh, like I said, it's already imported for you in the homeworks. And I don't think it's going to be too commonly used in notebooks because it usually kind of helps you organize multiple tests. When you're only doing a single test at a time, uh, you know, it's not too bad to call the syntax directly. But you can see the output, right? So this is the name of, you know, Allman evaluating this expression or this object, right? But uh, this is actually coming from the... Scala test. Hey, so I'm going to go ahead and run this, and it's saying, uh, you know, this test and then this test, right? So it's a two tests. There's no other output from the Scala test because they passed, so we're we're good. Um, however, uh, you know, um, this other stuff is coming from our the uh, prints we already have, either from the Chisel tool flow or from stuff we've added ourselves. So there's a question from chat about how we'll identify inputs and outputs. Well, remember, we built up this entire infrastructure using stuff so far in the class, right? So, or sorry, in this lecture today. So, for example, we um, uh, built mechanisms to uh, take uh, inputs, in this case, one and two, a design instance, and the bit width, right? So this is already being passed into our test add function, right? And our test add function, which we defined previously, uh, you know, uh, takes inputs and also calls, uh, I, you know, properly encodes them to peek and poke, sorry, pokes them first, or I should say, and it also compares them against the model, right? So that does it all for us, right? It's a nice kind of use of encapsulation. So it's definitely a, a good pattern here of building a model or an oracle to know what the right answer is, and also automating the interaction between uh, the model and um, uh, your input case, and that way, you can kind of easily construct tests together without having to kind of know all that.
Okay, uh, so that's just a brief demo of Scala tests. I'm not going to use it again in this lecture just because, you know, we have these kind of concise tests we're doing uh, in these notebooks for a lecture, but in the homeworks, yeah, we'll, we'll be using Scala tests. And for the most part, it shouldn't be super crazy uh, because um, we're going to give you kind of scaffolding and you may choose to add another test. And when you add your own test, you have to probably kind of copy the syntax, uh, but otherwise it should be okay. Uh, and so the question is, oh, what happens if, uh, you know, there's a mismatch, right? Or how do I know it's an error? So for example, uh, you know, what if I made this four? It's still going to pass, right? Because this, this is just a label. This is not parsing the string, right? So that label is, you know, for me, it's humans to read. It's not going to be anything that's used in a test. Now, in this case, right, if I change this input, it's still going to pass, right? Because the way we've constructed our test class hierarchy, uh, it's going to, uh, you know, pass the same input to the model and to design, and they're both going to get the same answer. Now, to actually really break this, which I think is kind of a request to see how this looks when this goes south, um, let's go ahead and do that. So yeah, let's go ahead and, you know, add one to one of our inputs. So it's going to fill that test because it no longer matches up, but it did define test add. So we look at a failure inside of Scala test now. Uh, if we do that, oops, you know, what? I think the prior thing failing might have allowed that module uh, definition to uh, persist. So we're going to go temporarily comment this out and reevaluate that. So we've defined test add and now test add is doing the wrong thing. And now when I run the Scala test, yeah, see, boom. Um, and so uh, both tests failed, right? And we see this in two places. We see this <laughs> coming from uh, Scala test saying, hey, this thing's through an exception. And we see this from uh, chisel tests saying the expect did not match up, right? Now, it's important to ask that question because we have this deep nesting of functions and loops it's not always super easy to see the inputs and outputs that cause this condition, right? So sometimes you may want to turn on a waveform or something like that to kind of go in and zoom in if it goes wrong. But hopefully the common case is that your tests are passing and it's kind of a sandy check you're kind of running them. Okay, now I'm gonna go quickly uh, undo this damage <laughs> uh, before I move on. Okay. Go ahead and, uh, great. And then this should also work. Fantastic. Um, as an additional uh, feature, which is once again experimental, as you can see it's included in Chisel 3 Experimental, uh, something called a bundle literal. So you may find it tedious to kind of keep poking wire by wire by wire, or say, if you want to instead do an entire bundle all at once, you can. It's a feature under development called bundle literal. And uh, I'm showing multiple ways of doing the syntax. Now the key thing is dot lit. So on a bundle instance, uh, you need to call dot lit. So it knows how to bind, what type you're binding this to. Then you need to give the mappings in this interesting syntax, which might make more sense in a few weeks, but you can see kind of where it's going. Okay, or assigning sign to false needs to be a chisel type or assigning magnitude to two needs to be a chisel type. So one way to get the type you're trying to do a bundle little for, and this is the way that they recommend doing it, is to ask for the type of the thing you're trying to assign to, right? And then, okay, so now we've produced this literal B0, and we can go ahead and poke that in. No problem. Um, and uh, alternatively, uh, you know, maybe you don't wanna, you know, uh, introspect what it is, you kind of, you know what it should be. You can declare an instance of it. And that instance doesn't really matter. Although it, uh, it doesn't matter to make sure the parameters match up, but then you can of course use that instance to instantiate this literal and go forward with it. Uh, and then of course I, you know, said this other way is the recommended way. Um, but either way, we are defined as kind of bundle all at once. Uh, new feature being played around with. If you want to use it, feel free. You got to use this import statement first. And so here we are, you know, defining uh, our thing. And, you know, it 
didn't produce any errors because it did the right thing. So we actually used it both for poking as well as for expecting, and we were able to kind of define all the values for bundle kind of all at once. Okay, so I have a sequential example and we don't have a lot of time left and that's okay. I'm glad to take these questions. And so I think what I might do is I might uh, kind of introduce the problem and then maybe end a minute early. So um, for our sequential component we want to test, we're going to do a queue and we're not even going to bog ourselves down implementing it. We're going to test the built-in one in the chisel, right? But you can imagine if I want to make my own queue, perhaps maybe I think, choices they made for implementing it maybe aren't as efficient. I want to make my own is more efficient for my use case. Maybe make my own queue, but just in queue. So queue is both going to be stateful and use the coupled interfaces, right? And so uh, both of those things kind of add a certain complexity to dealing with this. And uh, let's talk about why. So number one, stateful, you know, it's not just about the current inputs I give my test right now. It's also about all the prior things in this test so far. So you can see even something has very few inputs at a given cycle, as a test simulation runs longer, you know, you keep multiplying those inputs per cycle to get an even bigger and bigger design space, right? So you get a huge explosion in the state space. So exhaustive testing is almost always impossible, right? Um, in terms of testing every possible sequence of inputs, right? Um, so that, that's, that's gonna be hard. So uh, we're going to be a little more deliberate about how to kind of navigate that space. And we're going to the conversation from earlier about, you know, okay, how, how do I not do exhaustive? Yeah, we're, we're not going to be able to do exhaustive. We're going to kind of be careful about uh, figuring out how do I want to kind of deliberately craft certain paths we know we want to make sure we get right. Think about certain corner cases, as well as um, uh, also um, trying to make sure we uh, perhaps do some randomness as well. Uh, and so what are we gonna be testing? Well, we're gonna be testing uh, a queue. So this is the queue from Chisel Util. In this case, we're gonna do the pipeline version without the fast flow through. Easy for us to model that. If we wanna do the fast flow through, we need to do more stuff, because remember, we're gonna write a model for our queue. <laughs> and so these generated parameters do change the behavior of the queue, right? So depending on how we implement our model, we might have to implement multiple models or at least incorporate those differences internally. In terms of interfaces, uh, you know, matching this queue, we're using the coupled. And you know, we did do flip for the input. And then of course we connect the inputs directly to the queue. Uh, this module doesn't really do anything other than just kind of be a house for this built-in uh, built, uh, built feature from the Chisel uh, util. Um, yeah, and of course we of course can run it and we have now the queue instance. Um, and so yeah, I'm gonna save this module model implementation maybe for next time. I'm gonna pause for any more questions. I will briefly mention, so what we're gonna do in the following lecture uh, when I come back to this material, is we're gonna go through building up our own abstractions once again to do this. There are more sophisticated testers than the ones we're using. Uh, in particular, in the newest chisel test, there's a new functionality where they're trying to bring in notions of uh, parallel threads in the concurrency sense, not in the performance sense, to make it easier to reason about this. Because if you imagine for the coupled queue, you have the concurrency of what's going on in the input versus what's going on in the output, and how do you reason about those? Um, there's this business with fork and join. Uh, I've chosen <laughs> to not teach that and not go into that in this course. I think it's a little bit too complicated, and a little bit too experimental. But I'll, I'll go ahead and revise these slides, provide a link to that if it's something interesting you want to take a look at and play with. Uh, so we're actually using the more default, simpler testers, but we're going to be kind of building more of our own abstractions on top of it. And with that, I guess I will uh, let us everyone out a minute early and I'll pick up this uh, sequential example uh, first thing. Uh, and lecture on Monday. And next week, of course, will be exciting because we're also move on to the much awaited uh, functional programming and have a much easier way to kind of express things and deal with things. Great. Uh, okay, have a good one, folks.